This is the second in a sermon series I've entitled Telling the Truth. Now, I, I began this last week saying to you, I don't know if summer is a good time to start a sermon series that's going to require some intellectual heavy lift, lifting on the part of the listeners. Um, so I wasn't sure I had to continue this, but uh, after last Sunday, quite a few people told me that this that was great, they'd like to hear more, and I should continue. And so uh, this morning, uh, I didn't want to dis disappoint those two people. <laughs> so, so here we go. This is the second one. You remember last week we began with the question that Pontius Pilate threw at Jesus at his trial. The question of the ages, what is truth? Our culture still asks that question, and truth is in trouble these days, my friends. In Western culture, there is no widespread sense that there is a universal truth that applies to everyone. So last week, we went through a brief lesson in the history of philosophy to show how we got to this point where we are today, where trouble, uh, where truth is in trouble. We started first with the biblical worldview, which was the way of truth for almost two millennia after Jesus Christ. It was believed that moral truths found in the Ten Commandments and in the Sermon on the Mount applied to everybody. And likewise, um, spiritual truths applied to everyone. Truths like all have fallen short of the glory of God. And, and things like God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The biblical worldview said there are moral and spiritual true truths that apply to everyone everywhere in all times. There was a general agreement that these truths could be known because God had revealed them in the scriptures and in the person of Jesus and that these were the most important truths that anyone could know because they would outlast even this earth we live on. Then, beginning in the 1600s, the biblical worldview was supplanted by the modern worldview. Now, when I say these major worldviews, these are, these are things that influence entire society and culture. The way we think, how we determine what is true, right, and wrong, how we make decisions, and the way we go in life. Now, these, these huge concepts, these huge things, these worldviews, are not easily described in 30-second sound bites. That's why politicians rarely deal with them. They're assumed in their, their speeches and their sound bites. But it's important for us to consider the whole thing so our eyes are wide open to what we're dealing with here. So, and also the other thing I want to say, when I say um, we went from a biblical worldview to a, po to a modern worldview view, and then to the postmodern worldview, doesn't mean that on such and such a date, everybody turned a page in their, their book of life and they started on this new worldview. Now, these things kind of ooze through a society and a culture over a long period of time. So, beginning in the 1600s, the biblical worldview was being supplanted by the modern worldview. Instead of looking to God for truth, leading thinkers of the age began to look to humans for truth. Something was true if and only if it could be proved by human logic, reason, or science. Remember I said, just the facts, ma'am. That's the motto of the modern worldview. Just the facts, ma'am. And since spiritual truths cannot be tested by science or proved by reason, the modern worldview made spiritual matters less real and therefore less important than physical matters. It removed God from daily life, really and left humans with a cosmos too small to contain the human soul. <clears throat> this has led us then to the postmodern worldview, that era, that worldview that we've oozed into here in the 21st century. Postmodern thought says, if we can't know anything for sure about spiritual matters, then probably there are no universal spiritual truths. 
And so, so everyone is free to create his or her own truth. And every version of the truth is just as valid as any other. That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. The only thing you're not free to believe is that you have found THE truth, with a capital T, because that's just arrogant and intolerant with others who might not see it that way. Instead of just the facts, ma'am, the postmodern view asks, how do you feel about that? How's that working out for you? If it's working out for you, then it must be true. And if it doesn't work tomorrow, well, then you find another truth, right? But it doesn't answer the longing that's still there in the human heart, a longing for a connection with eternity. No doubt you figured out by now that I'm up here promoting the biblical worldview, truth and advertising, because I believe that God is the source of truth. And that's because I believe that the Bible's revelation shows us that there is a true truth, with a capital T, overarching all of our lives. And God, who is true, designed us and the universe to live in truth. And this is true for everyone, in all places, at all times. Let's start with the journey of life. Life as a journey is one of the, the common themes, really, that humankind has under, used to understand itself and the meaning of life. You find it in the Old Testament story of the Israelites uh, in the book of Exodus. They're wandering out of slavery, wandering through the wilderness to find their freedom led by God. You find it in the book of Hebrews that talks about Abraham's journey as a model for Christians. And you find it in, in secular literature like Homer's Odyssey or in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, or John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Mark's Twain, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. Interesting author he is, actually Polish, emigrated to America, learned English, and wrote novels in English. Can you believe that? Jack Kerouac, On the Road, his series. How about, Tol How about Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings? These are all stories of journeys as metaphors for finding meaning in life. In our life journey, traveling through the twists and turns of fate, seeking to fulfill our quest, we find ourselves often, if we pause long enough, asking these questions. Where am I? Where am I meant to end up? You know, when I started out, I thought I was going to get here. And now I find myself over here. How? Did I get here? Or sometimes we say, how did I get here? <laughs> we may have a sense of how helpful it would be to have a map to guide us. But which map to use and where do you find it? Let me tell you a little story about the renowned economist E.F. Schumacher. He wrote about a visit that he took to St. Petersburg, Russia. At that time when he took the visit, it was called Leningrad because it was still under communist rule. He was sightseeing, and he got to a point that he, got, he was really puzzled. He didn't know where he was. He was certain that he had followed the map correctly. But what he saw on the map, what the map told him, isn't what his eyes saw right there in front of him. He saw several huge Russian Orthodox churches, their golden onion domes high above him. None of these were on the map. Well, that's simple, said his guide. We don't show church, churches on our maps. Schumacher observed, that is not the first time I had been given a map which failed to show many things I could see right in front of my eyes. All through school and university, I have been given maps of life and knowledge on which there was hardly a trace of many of the things that I most cared about and that seemed to me to be of the greatest possible importance to the conduct of my life. Reminds me of many of my um, colleagues who went to seminary and said, I didn't learn anything in seminary that applies to local church. Maps for the journey. Last week we looked at three maps for understanding reality. The biblical map, the modern map, and the postmodern map. 
They are intended to be truth maps, reality charts, guides by which we are meant to make our way through life. They're supposed to help us see the truth. But as we saw, the modern and the postmodern maps leave out many of the things that the human soul cares about most. Things that are of the greatest possible importance for determining how we are to live in this world. Ask which map will lead to the truth and the Western world cannot agree. Perhaps people are simply groping in the dark looking for the truth. Now you don't have to be a prophet or an expert in philosophy to see where this will all lead. If we can't agree upon the truth map, and then we're going to be led into a time of spiritual and moral anarchy. Maybe we're already there. Last week, I began to define the problem we find ourselves in. And I hope to complete that this morning. So please be patient with me. Bear with me. If you start to nod off, raise your hand, and I'll raise my voice, okay? <laughs> so let's take a, a closer look at these two models, these two maps for truth. The biblical model... And the model that has begun to dominate Western culture, the postmodern view. Several years ago, I saw a really good movie. The movie Amistad. How many of you have seen that movie Amistad? It depicts events in America between 1839 and 1842. It's about a slave ship, the Amistad. True story. The slaves had taken over the ship. And they sailed it to Massachusetts, where slavery was illegal. And they threw themselves on the mercy of Massachusetts, wanting their freedom. Now the ship owner sued in court to have his ship and his cargo, the slaves, returned to him. And so protracted legal battles ensued. And slavery, again, became a major public issue in the nation. Now, I want you to think about that issue, slavery, <clears throat> and to answer this question. How do I know that slavery is wrong? And how could I convince others that slavery is wrong? But you must answer those questions without any reference to God or the Bible. You can't read them Exodus, where God says, I've seen the affliction of my people in slavery in Egypt. How would you convince someone that slavery is wrong without referring to God or the truths we learn from the scriptures? Well, you might have some premise of humanism that we ought to treat each other the way we want to be treated. Yeah, but where do you get that? Where'd that come from? You just make that up? Might be true for you, but it's not true for me. Huh? Truth, you see, matters. It really does. How you view moral truth has significant implications. Postmodernism really has no explanation for the problem of evil or a basis for telling others that what they're doing is wrong. Think about it. If there is no overarching truth that applies to all of us, if moral truth is simply what the individual believes to be true or that group believes to be true, then the ultimate result will not be a time of peace and goodness and harmony where everyone accepts and tolerates everyone else. The result will be that a powerful man will step into this moral vacuum and use his power for his own purpose. And no one will be able to tell him he's wrong. If you look at what put an end to slavery in the United States, and in Britain for that matter, it was to a large degree Christians saying it's wrong. 
It's wrong in the South. It's wrong in the North. It's wrong everywhere, regardless of how slave owners believe or feel about it. As the Civil War anthem, the Battle Hymn of the Republic stated, God's truth is marching on. His truth says it's a lie that some people can be treated like possessions, like cattle. It's a lie that one man can own another man. It's a lie that you can mistreat a man made in the image of God and claim to love that same God. Truth matters because it's how we fight evil. The evil that is in the individual soul and the evil that's in societies and governments is fought and overcome by the power of truth. That's one reason Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, back to our two models of truth, the biblical view and the postmodern view that's becoming dominant in our culture. They are two very different roadmaps. The biblical view of life and the postmodern or cultural view provide very distinct maps for our journey through life. The first difference between these two is this. The biblical view says spiritual and moral truth is objective and universal. Objective and universal. It is determined by God. And it applies to everyone. Objective because it comes from God. And universal because it applies to everyone. The postmodern or cultural view, on the other hand, says that spiritual and moral truth is subjective and relative. It is determined by the individual and only applies to the individual and only in the present situation, as long as I feel it's the truth or as long as it's working for me. When the biblical view says that truth is objective, it means that truth is defined outside of and independent from the individual. There is a standard, and there is a standard giver who is over and above the human individual and human race. The biblical view says that we use our intellect and our experiences to discover this truth. When the cultural view states that truth is subjective, it means that truth is determined from within the individual and by the individual. It says that my experience my reason, my feelings, not only tell me what seems right, they determine for me what is right. My experiences and feelings not only guide me to the truth, they define truth for me. The culture of you says that we use our intellect and our experiences to create truth. Now, often we don't see it that way within ourselves because we feel so strongly about something, but there it is. You know, our feelings take over. And then we make decisions based on that. So that's really telling us what we believe is true. Here's the critical difference between these two worldviews. The biblical view states that spiritual truths and moral truths, uh, moral values are true because they correspond to reality. The biblical view believes that there are spiritual and moral truths that exist outside of us. It doesn't matter what I believe about them. It doesn't matter if I like them. It doesn't matter if I agree with them or not. They exist because they are reality. You know, you've seen it uh, at the roadside, uh, the, uh, the, the highway rest stops here in California, at least the ones that are, that are open. Um, um, What's that? Gravity, it's the law. Just like, you know, the speed limit, it's the law. Gravity, it's the law. It's true. The culture of you states that something is true because I believe it is true. And it is true as long and only as long I believe it is true. My experiences determine what is true for me. Basically, it really comes down to this. Who determines reality? God or you? Does God determine who we are or do we determine who God is? When Moses encountered God in the wilderness, Moses asked, what is your name? 
Who shall I tell the Israelites has sent me to deliver them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's not I am who you want me to be. It's not I am what you think a God should be. It's not I am who your heart tells you he is. You know, you hear, hear people all the time say, well, the God I worship would never do X, X Y, Z, whatever it is, they fill in the blank. Or, or people say, my God is a God of, and they fill in the blank with whatever it is they have decided a God should be. You know, invariably, in all those statements, they're just expressing what they want things to be for them, how, you know, to make themselves comfortable. The great I am is not a spiritual Plato. We can't twist and mold him to fit our fancy. The God I worship is I am. People have always tried to create their own pictures of God. One author wrote, in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and ever since we've tried to return the favor. <laughs> God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's who God was. That's who God is. That's who God will be. And that determines reality. Now, the second difference between these two roadmaps of life, the biblical view and the postmodern view, the second difference. The biblical view says truth is universal. And the cultural view says truth is relative. The biblical view states that there are spiritual and moral truths that apply to all people in all places in all times. The cultural view states that truth is different from person to person or group to group, from situation to situation, and from culture to culture. Dr. Alan Bloom, in his book, The Closing of the American Mind, writes, one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of Almost every student entering the university believes that truth is relative. Have you heard people make statements like these? Well, I have my beliefs, but who am I to say what others believe is wrong? Or, you know, it sounds really tolerant, doesn't it? I could never do that myself. It would be wrong for me, but that doesn't mean it's wrong for someone else. Now, there is everything right with respecting people you disagree with and people who hold different values and morals than you do. It's, it's right to respect them. But there is nothing Christian in trying to force others to believe what we believe, right? Neither is there anything Christian about denying that there are universal rights and wrongs. Why does the Christian view state that there is spiritual and moral truth for all people in all cultures and all times? Because there is one God. I am. Reality. There is one God and it is his nature and character that determines truth. I am didn't say to Moses on the mountain, I've seen the suffering of the Israelites in Egypt and I think it's a good deal. No, he said, I've seen their suffering and I want them free. It is God's nature and character that determines truth. That's very important. God is reality. Why is hatred wrong? Because God is love. Why are adultery and betrayal and disloyalty wrong? Because God is faithful. Why are deceit and falsehood wrong? Because God is true. Why is bitterness wrong? Because God is forgiving. Why is lust wrong? Because God is pure. That's why our lives 
work best when we are loving and faithful and true and forgiving and pure of heart because that's when we are flowing with reality the way God has made this world and made us instead of fighting against reality. One rationale that evil people have used to protect themselves from moral criticism is that there is no universal moral truth. If a way of life works for someone or some group, then it must be right for them. These folks say our histories, our cultures, our circumstances are different, and it is arrogant of you and your culture to judge me for me and my culture. Again, from that movie Amistad, about the slave ship and those slaves seeking their freedom in Massachusetts. In one of the scenes there in the film, it shows South Carolina Senator John Calhoun making this very same point that I've just described. In the presence of President Martin Van Buren, who was from New York, Senator Calhoun tells the Spanish ambassador that the North has no right to condemn the South. Don't you dare judge us, Senator Calhoun says. We have a way of life that has been practiced by our fathers and by their fathers, Mr. Ambassador, just as it does in your country. Our way of life includes the timeless institution of slavery, an institution that you find in practically every society since the beginning of time. The North looks down upon us and tells us not that we're different, but that we're wrong. What right do they have to judge us? That is the question, of course. What right did they have to judge? Remember, when I was an undergraduate in college, and I was a history major, took a lot of history courses, and this one course was um, History of America, United States, Civil War to 1900. And I remember one lecture, the professor would come in and give these wonderful lectures. And one lecture, about Civil War, his thesis was one of the causes of the American Civil War was Reconstruction. The Northerners believed that the South needed to be reconstructed, that they were wrong. The institution of slavery was wrong and hurtful to the slaves and to the slave owners. I have on my computer the digital copy, copy of a journal whose uh, paper copy is in a museum back in Iowa. It belongs to my great-great-grandfather, Elijah Burton. He was a surgeon, a doctor, uh, in an Illinois regiment in the American Civil War. His journal is fascinating. He writes about, he, he, he was uh, with Sherman's army from, um, from Tennessee, Chattanooga, all the way through Atlanta and the march to Washington, D.C. By the way, I happened to mention that to a, a, a fellow from Georgia I met a number of years ago, and, he kind of scowled and he said, people remember that. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, in his journal, he writes in numerous places, places where they stopped and camped for some time, and he would always go into the nearest town to find the church and the doctor, the local doctor. Also mentions how he went out to some plantations to give medical care to the black people living out there. And numerous times he mentions how deforming to the soul is this slavery, not only to the slaves, but to the owners as well. Interesting, fascinating. That's the question, of course. What right did they have to condemn the South? If there are no universal moral truths, what right do the Northerners have to try to change the morals and the traditions of the South in the 1800s? And what gave them the right to impose their views on others? Maybe, maybe you could never be a racist yourself. But who are you to tell others that that's wrong for them? Maybe, maybe you would never shoot the last living bald eagle so it could be stuffed and placed on your mantle. But who are you to say it's wrong for me to do that? Maybe you think women should possess equal rights. But who are you to criticize the Taliban or the mullahs of Iran? When there are no moral absolutes or no agreement on what is the true truth, over and above us all, 
then morality is nothing more than individual or group preferences or might makes right. When there is no longer a thus saith the Lord, there is only a thus saith Fred or thus saith Judy. There's only thus saith Western culture or thus saith Eastern culture or, or thus saith the bigot or thus saith, saith the civil, right work, civil rights worker. And no one view or source has any higher authority or more validity, validity than the other one. There are no rights and no wrongs, only opinions. Where would that lead us to? What kind of society would that be? You want to live in that society? Better be armed. My, my truth tells me that just because that big screen TV is in your house doesn't mean it can't be in my house. That's where it leads to. The third difference I want to tell you, and I know I've gone a little bit long here today, and I appreciate your patience and your indulgence. I'll try to be a lot shorter next week and kind of wrap it all up. The third difference between these two different roadmaps for life is this. The biblical view says truth is unchanging. The cultural view says truth is ever-changing. The biblical view tells us that God's truth is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And the cultural view says that truth is evolving, or truth changes according to the circumstances or cultures of the time. Think about that. If moral truth is founded upon the, the, the nature and the character of God, as we stated earlier, then o the only way moral truth would change is if God's character were to change. If God is still kind of figuring things out, if he's a cosmic teenager and still needs to mature, Frightening thought, isn't it? <laughs> if, if, if who he was yesterday is not who he will be tomorrow, then spiritual and moral truth will also change. And that will lead to spiritual and moral chaos, really. Each one going his or her own way because they're not in agreement on what stage of evolvement God is on. Theoretically, I suppose God could be evolving and changing, but, but that's not the biblical view. The Bible says who he is, the glory of Israel, he, he who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Malachi says, I, the Lord, do not change. Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews, is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is the biblical view. God's character doesn't change, and so morality based on his character doesn't change. Truth is truth to the end of reckoning. Whew. Truth is not determined sociologically. Well, but, but mom, everybody's doing it. Truth is not determined democratically. You know, sometimes majority vote means all the fools are on one side. Truth is not determined by the Supreme Court. Real truth is bigger than all of that. What God has revealed to be true remains true. Let's be clear here. Just because I believe there are absolute truths, that doesn't mean that I think I have all the truth absolutely. I will be learning to the end of my life, and so will you, of God's truth. That's what we're supposed to use our intellect and our experiences for, to continue to discover God's truth. Over 500 years ago, the great Christian reformer Martin Luther wrote in his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We sing that once in a while here at church. One line in that hymn says this, God's truth abideth still. Actually, the line before that says, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. God's truth stands the test of time. And maybe that's why it's in trouble these days. We don't have the time 
for God's truth to work its way through our lives and the lives of the whole society. We want it all fixed tomorrow, or at least by November 7th. Is that the election day this year? And the, and the politicians promise us that they have the truth and it'll all be out there in clear force after election day. But of course, if they're postmodernists, the truth will change after election day, won't it? Ooh. God's truth stands the test of time. So choosing the right path, we've got those two maps to help us through life. Two reality maps, the biblical view and the postmodern view. They're vying for the hearts and minds of people today. They take us in drastically different directions. They cannot both be true. The cultural view of truth is very attractive because it's advertised everywhere in the media and pop culture. And it may seem like everyone's doing it. Take caution. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The biblical view, on the other hand, will lead us to healthy and wholesome living because it is grounded in reality. The reality of the creator of the universe. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Christians through the ages have proclaimed that there is truth with a capital T. And we have seen him the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. True enough that we must live by it, defend it, and share it with others. As you journey through life, as you guide and instruct your children, choose carefully which path you will follow. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen.